In this video, we will dive into the memoirs of legendary pilot pre-time hero Alexander Pokrishkin. You will hear an incredible story of fighting on the Black Sea, and how an ordinary Soviet pilot who was captured by Germans after his plane was shot down, escaped from German captivity, and the destiny of the brother of Alexander Pokrishkin, who fought on the North Front. Enjoy watching and, and don't forget to put likes and any comments. It is really helpful for promoting the video. On the low level at the water's edge, we need to fly for a long time, forgetting about the ground. Only somewhere out there, over the sea, we will be able to accidentally encounter an enemy plane, and for this we need to walk for a long time, trusting the plane and ourselves. We just need to see the enemy plane. Where one passes, doesn't supply there. The route between Saki and Odessa definitely exists. There is no communication by land anymore. I got accustomed myself to the sea in the Cuban, then flew to Tukinrog, Osipenko, Mariupol. But looking down at it now, I think about its step, and at the shore will not help us in any way if anything happens. Every time I looked overboard and saw a dark, stormy sea, I was disconnected for some seconds from the perception of the sounds of the engine. I was completely absorbed by the terrible element of water. By an effort of will, I got rid of its magnetism, returned to the safe world of my cabin. But now, in the first seconds, it seemed to me that the engine was not humming as before, and the hands on the instruments had moved threateningly to critical limits. The coach has long been left behind. In order to discover the intended flight round of enemy aircraft, we began to wander over the sea, changing course every now and then. And suddenly, he was walking to the left and slightly above us, under the clouds. It was a large three-engine Junker 52. Clinging to the water, I crept very close to him, but he did not react to it in any way. The bomber crew, apparently, had no idea that our fighters could be over the sea in such weather. The first burst forced the bomber to descend to the water. After the second one, it caught fire and collapsed into the sea. There was an explosion. Flames spread across the water. A few minutes later, we met another enemy plane, just as I was thinking about turning to attack, a whole group of aircraft appeared on the horizon in the distance. What should I do? We didn't have much fuel, and we could not attack the whole group, and it was not worth disturbing them now. We won't have time to cope with them anyway, and we will give out our appearance on this route to the enemy. I'm attacking the junkers in the belly. A thin trickle of smoke stretches from its wing. I slip under a falling plane, turn around, and see another ball of fire blazing over the waves. When we developed the film of the photo guns on our return home, the pilots began to look curiously at the shots that captured the flying and falling junkers. I immediately reported to the division headquarters about the results of the hunt on the Crimea Odessa route. After a few hours, I flew with Golubev to the sea again. And this time, we destroyed a German plane on the same spot. It became clear, the round of enemy flights takes place right here. Returning home, I made big plans. We will find a patch of land by the sea, arrange an aerodrome, station a group of our fighter aircraft there, and shoot down German Junkers 52S. At the airfield, I was informed. The division commander called and ordered me to contact him immediately. Why did you fly out without permission? Commander asked when I introduced myself to them on the phone. No one is forbidden to fight, comrade commander. And I forbid you to fly to the sea. From comrade commander, that's all I have to say. But others fly. There over the sea, whole flocks of German planes are flying. It doesn't matter. One bullet will hit and we don't have many twice heroes of USR. It can be everywhere, this bullet. Set aside objections. The army commander forbade you. Due to bad weather, free hunting has become almost the only type of work for combat aviation. Therefore, the army headquarters gathered a conference to share the experience of the best air hunters with all pilots. Having arrived together with Kolubev in the specified village, I introduced myself to the head of the conference, General Savitsky. We haven't seen him since Kuwin. He was still as energetic and fit. Savitsky asked me to help him draw up a work plan for the conference. After consulting, we decided to divide all the participants into two groups, hunters for air targets and masters of shooting at ground objects. The general took over the leadership of the first, and entrusted the second one to me. A lot of interesting and informative things were expressed in the speeches of the conference participants. Summarizing the experience of the best hunters, we sent all this material to the Air Force headquarters in Moscow. In the air over the front line, I had heard the name of the leader of the group Lavrinenkov more than once before. He served in another regiment and often relieved us on the cover of our troops. The name of the pilot, often heard on the air is remembered firmly, that it seems to live in memory by itself, demanding new and new details about him. Later, the almost legendary story of this pilot came to our regiment. I met Vladimir Lavrinenkov at the conference. Here the legend came to light for me in his true story. We had lunch and dinner all at the same table, business conversations were replaced by memories. There I saw this modest, silent, somehow aloof captain, whose name was the most popular among pilots these days. He gained this fame not only with his aerial battles, of which he had dozens, but also with a heroic act. Like other pilots, Lavrinenkov suffered from the German frame and aerial reconnaissance and spotter Fock Wolf 189. He attacked the frame over the Mayas River, the same place where Bereskin was injured when he collided with it during the attack. The frame fell to the ground, followed by Lavrinenkov on a parachute. 
where the parachute was opened, the gun was torn off. On German territory, he was seized by German soldiers. It had no medals or documents with him, only the last letter from home was in the pocket of his tunic, Lavernenkopf. We know this last name, the German officer who was conducting the interrogation rejoiced. The captain, of course, denied that it was his last name. But the German intelligence officers found an album of photographs of pilots, among which it was easy to recognize Levernenkov's characteristic face with thick eyebrows. It was impossible to deny it further. They questioned him about the deployment and the combat vehicles of our regiments. To talk about it or not to talk about completely depended on Lavernenkov, his ideological steadfastness, beliefs. He was silent. He was beaten. He kept silent. In a simple hut in the Donetsk village where this interrogation took place, the methods of the Gestapo dungeon were used. But they did not break the resistance of the communist pilot. The Germans had no choice but to send Lavernenkov to the deep rear. Maybe the horrors of concentration camps and sophisticated torture will loosen his tongue there. But just in case, in order to endear the pilot, Lavernenkov and another of our attack pilots were sent to the rear, not in a freight train, but in a passenger car compartment, in a company of German officers traveling home on vacation. And Lavernenkov decided firmly to run, luck or death, no matter what. Only a moment was needed, and it could only be chosen at night. So the last night has already come. The train was approaching Odessa. The guards, having put their suitcases full of bottles and canned food on their knees and opened them, got carried away with food. The machine guns are put aside. Lavernenkov and the stormtrooper pretended to be fast asleep. The stormtrooper kept holding on to Lavernenkov's tunic all the time in order to rush with him at his first movement. The officers at the table began to argue about something. So they both bent down to the suitcase, counting something and packing. The long-awaited moment has come. Lavrininkov knocked on the suitcase. Everything that was in it flew at the guards. A scream in the compartment. Soviet pilots jumped out of the car at full speed of the train, hitting the ground, tumbling. Shots, flashes of fire, the whistle of bullets. The train went on. In a village, the pilots exchanged everything they had on and with them for simple clothes and wandered east. It was not soon that they, long bearded in rags, got into one of the local partisan detachments and became its fighters. After a while they were transported by plane across the front line and they returned to the unit. This was where the verification of those suspected of such an easy escape from captivity was to begin. And this check might have dragged on for a long time if our army had not liberated Donbass. In particular, the village where German intelligence officers interrogated Lavrininkov. The old people huddled in the closet of this hut, all heard what was happening behind the wall. They recall with admiration the young, thick broad pilot who was silent like stone. These testimonies were supplemented by the data of the partisan detachment that came out to meet our units and the name of Lavrininkov. His feat in a duel with German officers became known throughout the country. I'd listened to this story then, looked at the silent captain and thought about other pilots and fellow soldiers whose fate was lost somewhere there, behind the front line. What are they doing to bring victory over the enemy closer? It's hard to answer, but on our way we will surely find more than one such hut, clearing, road, German concentration camp camp, which will testify to us the loyalty of people to their high duty to our motherland. This moment I remembered my brother. I remember when I received an order to fly to Krasnodar for the trial of traitors to the motherland. Back in Krasnodar, on the sidelines of the court, some unknown surgeon came up to me and asked, Are you Pokrishkin? Yes. Did you have a brother, whose name was Peter? Was? The word itself sounded somewhat unkind. The stranger's story confirmed my bitter guess. Together with Peter, the surgeon was in the personnel service. The war caught them on the finish. We were cut off and pressed to Lake Ledoga. Ammunition was running out and we had to sink our guns before leaving. We made rafts and went through the raging lake at night. Under the cover of darkness, it was still possible to hope for salvation from German aviation and swim to our position. Peter picked up a small group and stayed to cover our departure. At parting he told me, there are grenades and some cartridges, we will make our way through the woods. When we sailed away, shooting and explosions were heard behind us for a long time. I never saw him again. Do you know anything about him? No. So that's where he laid his head. Yes, it was Peter Pokrishkin. By the way, you look very much like him, especially your eyes. When I heard, hero of the Soviet Union Pokrishkin, I thought, is this really Peter? I knew this character a little. Such a man will not surrender. He of course went to the enemy with grenades, border, and then, after saying goodbye to the surgeon, I went to the meeting, listening to the new testimony of the defendants. I determined the main thing in the behavior of traitors to the motherland and animal fear of the enemy, of the slightest danger. How disgusting are these pathetic people who sold their souls in order to survive, and vice versa, in people who hate the invaders with all their soul. How much courage and loyalty they have to their fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, brides, to their homeland. For several hours, we listened to the indictment in the case of war criminals, traitors to the motherland, who operated in Krasnodar during the occupation of the 
city by German troops. Here for the first time, I comprehended the complexity of the events that played out in our occupied cities, the depth of the fall of individuals who sold themselves to the enemy, heard what grave atrocities Hitler's officers and soldiers committed, concentration camps, killing machines, ditches filled with shot old men, women, children, even though we were in a hot hall, just hearing these terrible details, set a chill down my back. I felt an urge to go into battle as soon as possible. On the dock, I recognized a dance teacher who taught young military men, including me in the House of Officers. Among the tortured, I heard the name of a Krasnodar doctor, whose daughter I was familiar with. The facts presented by the Commission for the Investigation of Atrocities were shocking in their incredible cruelty. The most important, the most sacred thing for me, has always been duty to the motherland. I did not stop before difficulties if they got in my way, I did not cheat either before my own conscience or before my comrades. In battle, I try to perform the task as best as possible, to inflict as much damage to the enemy as possible. I owe my high awards in many ways to my combat friends, fellow soldiers. Without their reliable support in battle, I would not have shot down even half of the planes that were listed on my account. Yes, I took risks in duels with the enemy, but my vacity was always based on clear interaction with my wingmen and other pilots.